May I say what a very real privilege it is to be here with you this evening and for the days of this week. The theme, as has been mentioned, is movements of Christian renewal, but another word in the title, contemporary movements of Christian renewal, because I want us to concentrate on that fairly difficult task of contemporary church history. It's always slippery, it's hard to do, and it's never done well, but I think there are times we have to try and do it. And so our subject, Contemporary Movements of Christian Renewal. First of all, just some introductory words about what is involved in this general theme, movements of Christian renewal, the importance of these, at least in more recent historiography, began a couple of generations ago. Kenneth Scott Latteret, the great Baptist church historian and particularly historian of missions, from the United States. He was one who stressed that the great movements that historians call awakening, those vast movements of Christian revitalization, he argued that they were the most important elements in Christian history. And working through Latourette, you'll see a good deal to substantiate that. Then there was Christopher Dawson, the English Roman Catholic medievalist who stressed the great importance of the movements of spiritual renewal in medieval Christendom. In an offbeat way, Monsignor Ronald Knox, the son of an evangelical Anglican Bishop of Manchester and himself a Roman Catholic, in that book Enthusiasm, uh, if Andrew felt that some of his professors at Edinburgh were hard on the Baptists, uh, let any evangelical Protestant read Knox and you really get a drubbing, but it certainly caused a lot of people to think. And to think about these movements that Knox was attacking so hard, and maybe there was more there than was being suggested. It was kind of a backhanded influence, I think, that the Mount Senior had. And then there were the voluminous volumes of the Irish Baptist and peripatetic preacher and teacher J. Edwin Orr who was more of a chronicler than a historian. It was just vast amounts of data, but the data was important and caused a lot of people in the 1950s to discuss this matter of Christian renewal movements. During the last 30 years on the American scene, for example, the writings of W.G. McLaughlin, concluding in the area of Christian Renewal with his volume of Revivals, Awakenings, and Reform, in which he argues that the Christian movements of renewal in the United States have been the major influence in the formation of each new cultural synthesis in the history of the Republic. Today there are a host of volumes on this subject by ranking scholars. Reginald Ward recently retired from the History Department at the University of Durham in England. In 1992, published Protestant Evangelical Awakening, in which he displays a prodigious knowledge of early 18th century movements on the European continent. Most of us had tended to think of the 18th century movements being Anglo-Saxon fundamentally. And here is an opening up of a whole new part and background to those movements. Then in 1993, the Oxford scholar John Walsh was honored with a festschrift entitled Revival and Religion Since 1700. From Australia, there's the work of a younger scholar, Stuart Piggin, and he certainly seems to be a new star in the study 
of renewal movements. And here, of course, one would speak of George Rollick, and I was thrilled to hear today of how he had been honored by this university. And uh, one thinks of his stress not only upon maritime movements, but maritime Baptist movements of renewal, and then taking that pattern and model and applying it to the whole Canadian scene, as almost no one else has done. Probably a word about vocabulary. As we've suggested, the way historians use the words today, awakenings refer to those vast movements that may encompass four or five generations and affect large sections of the Christian world. As I look at Christian history, it seems that we've had about five of these. The early church itself coming out of the New Testament is certainly an instance of Christian vitality. Then we move into early monasticism. And uh, I don't imagine here we have too many people of Irish extraction. If you stand in Toronto, you are suddenly aware that the basic culture of southern Ontario is Irish Protestant. And you have to be careful sometimes what you say. But when we look at early monasticism, we realize that that same movement of revitalization that was part of the early monastic movement occurred in Ireland hundreds of years later. And you might say, yes, many things occur in Ireland hundreds of years later, but uh, that's the way it goes. Anyway, that would certainly be the second great movement of renewal. The third is the High Middle Ages, the kind of area that Christopher Dawson would write so helpfully about. The fourth would be the Reformation, and the fifth would be the Evangelical Movement, which I really find to be a series of sub-movements. And since, as we go along in our evenings, we will have occasion to refer to some of these evangelical impulses. The first evangelical awakening, or as it's often called in the United States, the Great Awakening, sometimes called the Wesleyan Revival in England, I see as occurring from about 1735 to 1785. Then right on its heels comes the second awakening, about 1785 to 1825 the greatest and by far the most influential of these evangelical impulses. Then there seems to be a kind of plateauing. And what might, for lack of imagination, be called the third evangelical awakening occurs about 1857 to about 1890. And then there is that astonishingly rapid decline when the evangelical movement that has been so dynamic, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, all of a sudden moves into a recessive and reactive phase. And yet there is a movement in the very beginning of this century, which could, I think, be called the fourth evangelical awakening, although it's in a much more hostile world in the West, and this is from the period about 1904 to 1910. For those somewhat in the know who, are, who grew up in a family where these things are important, one might have heard of the Welsh revival. But that is really not very important uh, in this vast movement. It's rather what occurred in Brazil and Chile and in Korea and in Assam. It has been that brief movement prior to World War I and what it accomplished in those parts of what is called the two-thirds world, and in the church in those areas, that is of greatest significance. And then, of course, regionally, in the interwar period and in the post-World War II period, there were movements of Christian renewal, often in particular regions or denominations or subcultures of one kind or another. The word renewal that we are using here is more often used today as a synonym for what used to be called revival in the past, and is still sometimes used. It refers to shorter periods of time. 
It refers to movements that are taking place in one strand of Christianity or in one particular geographic area. They may be part of a wider awakening, but we don't know if they're going to be. And I think that's where we are in evaluating the kind of movements we're going to be looking at. What are they pointing to? What are they leading to? And people give vastly different interpretations. And so it's not my job here to say that these are signs of a great new awakening, but uh, it seems to me they have some significance in themselves and they may well be indicators of something greater. And this, I'm sure, is up to each of us if we choose so to do, to try and consider and weigh this kind of thing. A few words about the general characteristics of renewal movements. They tend to be a return to the past theologically. I don't mean that they are necessarily antiquarian or unintelligent. But simply, they believe that the revelation by God the Father in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit and in the Scriptures took place at a given point in history and to that they are always going back. They value the great theological heritage of Christian orthodoxy. Although they often may not know much about it in an academic sense, they seem to have a fairly gutty feeling for what is basic Christianity. It seems here that often it is the secondary and visible phenomena that these movements are judged by rather than a serious look at what they are teaching. And when one sees their basic teaching, one is usually impressed with how fundamentally and basically Christian they are. There is a tendency to follow the creeds of the early church and the confessions of the Reformation, even if some of them theoretically don't like creeds and confessions. Uh, as one who likes creeds and confessions, I find it delightful uh, to hear the language of Nicaea and Chalcedon uh, coming out of people who supposedly shouldn't like such things at all. Uh, they are Trinitarian almost always. And uh, as we see for the few examples that are not generally given a few generations, they will work themselves toward a Trinitarian theological position in some way or the other. Christologically, as we've already suggested, they are Chalcedonian. They are Christ-centered. Or, as we were used to in the last generation, speaking of them as Jesus' people or Jesus' kids. That was absolutely right, of course. They are very, very Christological. All these movements tend, by and large, to have a serious doctrine of sin, dealing with guilt, with bondage, with judgment. The atoning work of Jesus Christ, in a sacrificial sense, is almost invariably at the center. If we are dealing with Protestant groups, and we are basically going to be doing that these evenings, then of course Protestant orthodoxy must be added. The sole authority of Scripture in all matters of faith and life. Justification by grace through faith alone. They may not quite know what the word forensic means as an adjective before justification, but they generally have worked themselves fairly well through to an understanding that comports well with that understanding. The church exists not by a tactile apostolic succession, but by the presence of the apostolic gospel. 
fairly robustly Protestant. Now, along with this theology, these movements of renewal stress an experience of divine grace. Often spoken of as conversion, producing what some, like Professor Loveless at Gordon Conwell Seminary in Boston, have called live orthodoxy. They have that theology, and then they weld that with the experience which produces not a dead orthodoxy, but a very live one. They also have a very practical involvement in ministry. A passion, and I think that's the only right word, a passion for the kingdom of God to be realized. In the here and now in measure, in church and in society. I don't think the kingdom of God is a term we would often relate to some of these movements. We would think that often they are uh, withdrawn. But I think as we go deeper into them, we sense there is a tremendous concern for God's kingdom to come. They may see it coming in a slightly different way, but I don't think we'll ever understand them if we don't get this beating heart of these renewal movements. With a desire to penetrate existing groups and structures in church and state, which means that in some ways it must adapt and fit into society. It is not aloof. It is not uninvolved. The problem is that often the old wineskins, as I see it, can't contain this new wine. And they split. And, of course, to ecclesiastically organized and oriented people, there's nothing worse than splits. And so we just condemn people out of hand. If they split, often the splitting is not so much their fault. It's been there has been such rigidity in the existing Christianity. But, again, the more I look at these movements, I find them with a profound concern for the church, even though they're often rebuffed by the existing ecclesiastical bodies, bad mouth put down, they have a remarkable concern for the Church of Jesus Christ. And they have a deep concern for society, again, in their own particular way. They are not fundamentally sectarian. And yet so often that is the very word and attitude that is applied to renewal movements. If you want real sectarianism, you don't look at renewal movements, you look at reactive movements. And reactive movements tend to say that everybody except us is apostate. That's an easy position, you know, you've just wiped everybody else off the map. That's sectarian. I don't see the renewal movements as being fundamentally sectarian, although it may look like it at times, but often I think the fault is ours that we've driven them, as it were, out into the wilderness. They share a forward-looking attitude. As William Carey gave such evidence of being a good Baptist renewalist, expect great things from God and then attempt great things for God. Now, I know there's a lot of discussion today. Is that exactly the wording of Carey? Well, I think it's good enough. Uh, it certainly tells us the kind of Christian he was. He was expecting great things in the future. And, of course, in all of these movements, one finds a considerable measure of human frailty. But Jimmy Baker and Jimmy Swaggart are not the whole story. And we would be very foolish and very unfair if we tried to suggest that they were. Now, the word contemporary, we've already suggested this is a difficult thing to do to try and look at contemporary movements, but uh, I think at least it's worth a try. We're talking about the Methodist Pentecostal heritage this evening because Methodism was the background for most early North American Pentecostals. And Pentecostalism is a movement that does take its rise in North America. 
Although it was not always among the main strands of North American Methodism, many of the early Pentecostals came out of what church historians call come-outer Methodism, those groups in the 1880s and 90s that were disturbed by the lack of what they conceived to be traditional holiness teaching in Methodism. Because Methodism and Pentecostalism share a common origin and family likeness, Methodism can provide a helpful interpretive model in looking at Pentecostalism. Just as when I try to teach about Maritime Baptists and show how different they are from Ontario and Quebec Baptists and from Baptists in Western Canada, I always find myself turning to the Southern Baptists and say, now look, the Southern Baptists went south from New England and the Atlantic Baptists came north from New England, but they're like each other. They come out of the same origin, and they're different from any other Baptist I've ever seen in this country. It, it's something of that kind of similarity of origin and the hallmarks that then are given as a result that I see Methodism and Pentecostalism in that continuity. Methodism, I think anyone agree, would agree, was the key element in the Anglo-Saxon phase of the first evangelical awakening. There might be certain regions we could raise an exception, but by and large, Methodists were surging ahead in that mid and late 18th century period. It seems to me that Pentecostalism looks like the first phase of whatever is happening in renewal in world Protestantism today. Now just a little bit about Methodism to set that background for Pentecostalism. The theology of Methodism as it was passed on to Pentecostalism. That tradition of orthodoxy. The emphasis on Armin Arminianism, prevenient grace, all by that grace are able to respond to the gospel. Wesley claiming he didn't so much get it from Arminius, he got it from his high church Anglican background. The Methodists had the experience of divine grace of conversion and then they had the post-conversion experience of sanctification, the experience of perfect love, perhaps wisely in Wesley's day, more motive than actual accomplishment, but so important for Pentecostalism. The ministry, a church organized virtually de novo, Sometimes as pastors, we wish we could be in that kind of situation, carrying the load of history on our backs in congregations. Anyway, Methodism was able to start anew around those two foci of evangelism and discipleship. So there are the circuit preachers, and there are the lay local preachers, and the lay exhorters. And then in discipling, there's the class meeting and the bands, and on and on it went. Wesley's genius in organization and in administration. All of this, I think, gives us some idea of what we're going to see in Pentecostalism. A good deal of emotion in worship, too, in Methodism, and that'll be passed on. An attitude of optimism, it's not just an attitude of optimism in Methodism, it's a theology of optimism, post-millenarianism, in harmony with the Enlightenment, as so many historians are pointing out today about Wesley. Not an Enlightenment man in his basic theology, but in some of these secondary theological matters, Enlightenment ideas of progress and development are very much there in his eschatology. And in Methodism, we see it penetrating other groups. An interesting dichotomy in Methodism, a certain aloofness from other denominations, and yet 
many of their methods and their theology penetrating other denominations. Methodism, generally ministering to those on a subsistence level economically, and again, we can keep that in mind as we carry through. Phenomenal growth was the part of Methodism through the 18th and even well on into much of the 19th century. We even remember in Canadian history there's a point in the late 19th century when Methodism beats out both Presbyterianism and Anglicanism as the largest Canadian denomination. And then, of course, decline came in. And I don't think there's any point here in going into Methodist decline, but it did. And I would make the suggestion that in many ways Pentecostalism has come on stream to fill in that blank and then to be the first stage of something newer. Most early Pentecostals came from Methodism or one of its offshoots uh, in Ontario. We find that almost all of them came out of Bishop Horner's uh, Holiness Movement Church. Uh, if they didn't come from that, a lot came from the Christian Missionary Alliance, which whatever it is today in those days was a holiness as well as a healing church. We think of Pentecostalism in spite of whatever tributaries there may be coming toward its origin we come to the famous date of 1906 at Azusa Street in Los Angeles. The cynic will say, oh yeah, California again. And you can dismiss anything if it's California. I guess it's a little more maybe Texas today than California, but uh, you, you know the sort of attitude. And we Canadians are excellent at that. And we can get away from thinking about all sorts of things by making that decision. Here is this movement, meets in an old church which had become a warehouse with a congregation sitting on planks and with some orange crates as the pulpit. And the leader was, humanly speaking, a person who had more strikes against him than almost anyone you could mention. His name was W.J. or Daddy Seymour. He was poor, he was one-eyed, he was not well-educated, he was black, and he was holiness. Now you put all that together, that is not a very impressive curriculum vitae. And yet people came from the ends of the earth, literally, to Azusa Street, just as they're doing today to the airport vineyard in Toronto. The more I have tried to meditate on the life of Seymour and some other things we'll allude to in these early years of Pentecostalism, I must confess that only one biblical text comes to my mind, and it is from the Beatitudes of our Lord, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Who would have ever driven five miles to hear Daddy Seymour? But in the midst of this movement, People came from around the world. Pentecostal distinctives, well, in so many ways they follow through from Methodism. Generally Arminian, but there are exceptions, and I think we in Canada have had more of them. J.E. Purdy, if you know anything about the history of Canadian Pentecostalism, a towering figure. An Anglican clergyman, a graduate of Wycliffe College, Toronto, said that he got all his theology from Griffith Thomas, who taught systematics there from 1908 to 19, something like that. Then went into the Pentecostal movement, was the principal of their only Bible college from 1925 to 1950 in Winnipeg, Western Bible College. My last memory of seeing Dr. Purdy was in 1970, he was just entering his 90s. I happened to be giving the Lenten sermons at Holy Trinity Anglican Church, if you know Winnipeg, right at the heart of the city across from Eaton's store. And every noon hour, Dr. Purdy and I believe it was the second Mrs. Purdy were there. And the last day he came up and spoke. 
he had known my grandfather and my father in Winnipeg, so he felt he had every right, and he did, to come and speak, and I was glad he did. And as any octogenarian, or I guess almost nonagenarian, uh, he loves to reminisce. And oh, he said, dear brother Rennie, how I love to see those enthusiastic young Pentecostals come into Western Bible College. But I always felt they needed some good solid theology, so I gave them the three volumes of Charles Hodge. Now, I don't know where else in world Pentecostalism that was going on. And those in the know have said that much of the very strong, stable leadership of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada goes back to the generation of people who cut their teeth in all sorts of ways, but theologically as well, under what Purdy was giving them. The other... Uh, source of non-Arminianism has been the oneness people. Now you have the big oneness church in New Brunswick, I understand, the United Pentecostals. In Western Canada on the prairies, the oneness tended to move into the Apostolic Church of Pentecost. Uh, they have worked out uh, their theology now. They're a Trinitarian body, but they also have had much more of a kind of Reformed theology than is traditional for Pentecostalism. But these are just for Canadians. These are rather unusual things. I don't think you find these much anywhere else in the world. It's nice to know that we at, at times as Canadians uh, can do things a little bit differently than anybody else. Then, of course, there is a post-conversion baptism of the Holy Spirit with power for service. Those in the southeastern United States tended to say there were three basic forms of renewed Christianity or in the life. There was conversion, there was the baptism of the Holy Spirit for sanctification, and then there was a second baptism of power for service. Most uh, northern Pentecostals in the United States and most Canadian Pentecostals have stressed a two-phase experience, that of conversion and then of power for service. This power is identified with the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit given in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the gift of other languages, the gift of tongues is the evidence that the genuine gifts are being given. Pentecostals are as aware as anybody else that in miracles you might have some phoniness. Oh, you can get phoniness in lots of other areas too. But they, they know that uh, these things may produce superstition very readily. But in order to guarantee, then tongues as the sign gift was held up. The Pentecostals, in their eschatology, are at first sight very different from their Methodist forebears. And yet they are not when we get into them. By profession, they hold the pessimistic eschatology of premillenarianism, a part of the reactive form of conservative evangelical Protestantism, often known as fundamentalism, in which the church and society in this age are both heading for irremediable ruin and apostasy, which will only be stopped by the return of Jesus Christ. Hard to imagine a more pessimistic, a non-renewalist eschatology than that one. But the Pentecostals inserted the latter rain teaching, taking biblical imagery of an early and a latter rain that is to fall upon the earth, and that they were introducing a brief latter reign before the second advent of Jesus Christ when all human organizations and structures, both ecclesiastical and civil, would come tumbling down. But there would be this brief period in which the Holy Spirit would be poured out and the Pentecostals were the inaugurators of this. This would lead to an evangelization of the nations 
the kind of phrase that an average Pentecostal, uh, an average premillennialist could never conceive of. He wanted to talk about God calling out a people for his name. He never seemed to look at the other Bible texts where the apostles speak of discipling the nations. But the Pentecostals held these things together in what I find a very, very interesting amalgam. So, although es ostensibly a very pessimistic eschatology, in actual fact and practice, a very optimistic one. I don't think the Pentecostals could ever have been any kind of renewal movement if they hadn't made this fascinating weaving together of two kinds of eschatology. Their worship had a good deal of participation, emotion, enjoyment in it. And this kind of worship, again, seemed to be most effective in ministering to the poor. In fact, one of the historians of American Pentecostalism has entitled his volume, Vision of the Disinherited. The spread of Pentecostalism throughout the United States, both black and white, initially for about a decade, it was an interracial movement. But I think understanding something of the dynamics of American society, it would be hardly possible for that to continue. And so white and black Pentecostalism have gone their own ways until I think last year. There was a meeting of leaders of the Assemblies of God, of the Church of God in Christ, the great black Pentecostal movement, and others seeking a rapprochement. In a number of European countries, Pentecostalism is the largest form of Protestantism, as in France and in Italy, strong in Scandinavia and Russia. But Latin America surely has to be a place that we must come. In 1910, the famous World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh pronounced that Latin America no longer needed missionaries, as it was a Christian Roman Catholic continent. The reason for this fascinating statement was to get the Roman Catholic Church to participate in the proposed cooperation of the churches which was to follow from Edinburgh and which finally a generation and more down the road would issue in the modern ecumenical movement. I find this quite a depressing story it seems to show me how possible it is that ecclesiastical politics can blind vision and blind one to reality. But in spite of what was being decided in certain important circles, three virtually illiterate European migrants in the United States were being called to missionary service in Latin America. Two of them, Gunnar Vingren and Daniel Berg, by their names suggest their Swedish origin. They were working in the steel mills in Gary, Indiana, than which nothing could be closer to an inferno, I don't think. I'm sure many of you have seen them in days gone by when they were belching out the fire and smoke. These men were in an early Pentecostal prayer meeting and somebody gave a word of prophecy and said, Vingren and Berg, you are to go to Para." They had not a clue where or what Para was. Somebody had the great idea of getting out an atlas, and they found that Para was a northeastern state in Brazil. Enough money was raised that evening to send these two men as far as New York. They got jobs as stevedores, and they got off the boat in Brazil. And there they gave their lives and the founding of the Assemblies of God in Brazil which church statisticians today have almost given up trying to compute its growth and its strength. The other man was an equally simple and poor immigrant, an Italian in New York City by the name of Louis Francesson, 
who believed God called him to the great Italian community in Sao Paulo in that same year of 1910. And so he went, and out of his work has come the Congregations of Christ in Brazil, again one of those denominations computed today in the multiplied millions of members. Seems like Daddy Seymour. It seems the day of small things. It seems the day when any respectable person would have laughed the thing out of court. Maybe that's what renewal is like. It's very unrespectable. And one has to have eyes that can see through that. About the same time, a Methodist missionary, Willis Hoover in Chile, was removed from his denomination for entering into the Pentecostal experience. While Methodism in Chile has remained largely stagnant, having today about the 4,000 members it had in 1910, Pentecostalism has grown to include over 10% of the population of the nation. Protestantism in Latin America has today grown to such an extent, in certain countries at least, that David Stoll, a very critical observer who has written some very harsh volumes in the past about aspects of Latin American Protestantism, now has come out with a recent volume, Is Latin America Turning Protestant? I find it almost impossible to conceive such a question even being raised. And of course he's basically talking about Pentecostalism which comprises three quarters of Latin American Protestantism. I probably should not be surprised because I remember ten years ago in a chapel service David Phillips who now has become the head of what is it Canadian Baptist something or other uh, standing in the chapel and saying, from my work in Brazil, I would say that Brazil will be one of the great Protestant nations of the future. And as a former teacher of David's at Regent College in Vancouver, I took him to my office and took him to task. But he had lots of data. And of course, what has transpired in the last decade only goes on to give us considerable measure of substantiation to those kind of claims. Everett A. Wilson, in an article in the recent book, Modern Christian Revivals, published interestingly enough by the University of Illinois Press, gives these figures for Latin American Protestantism, and of course, so much Pentecostal. 1970, 18 million. 1990, 36 million. The projection for 1995, 45 million. David Martin, the well-known English sociologist of religion, in Tongues of Fire, subtitled Protestant Explosion Latin America, contends is by far the most important religious movement in Latin America today. He argues that many scholars have been blinded by Latin American liberation theology because it seems to confirm their view of life. But, he argues, it is... Latin American Protestantism with its heavy Pentecostalism which is changing the very culture of Latin American society. Now maybe it's because he's an Englishman but he says it is producing the Anglicization of the Hispanic world. Where a culture formerly attuned and he uses such words as festivals, leisure, now has a work ethic discipline of sobriety, thrift, family, and church for men as well as women. He sees this development as an indication of a coming one world culture, which would accompany and be germanely related to the one world capitalistic economy, which we have seen emerge in the last half decade or so. This is an interesting interpretation by a sociologist of religion of the very highest credentials of the social influence of a movement that we would often say has no social concern whatsoever. And of course Pentecostalism has spread throughout the world having one of the great missionary forces of the 20th century and often not uh, necessarily organized under societies or denominational bodies or anything like that. 
In Canada, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada has about 250,000, a quarter of a million members. And it's estimated that about 50% of Canada's Pentecostals and Charismatics are in the PAOC. This suggests a figure of about half a million in that whole wider movement. Some very prominent Canadians, David Maines, our premier religious broadcaster, Brian Stiller, the head of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, and now my boss for whatever teaching I do at Ontario Seminary, and uh, Jimmy Patterson of Vancouver, usually touted in all our business pages as the third wealthiest man in Canada, totally self-made, and when the B.C. government was scared that Expo 86 would not come off, who did they turn to but Jimmy to set the things on the rail, and it was a howling success. You can usually see Jimmy tootling his trombone any Sunday evening you care to go to Glad Tidings Temple on Fraser Street in Vancouver. Pentecostal Assemblies has also, I believe, in Canada, indicated that it is not existing just to itself. In fairly recent years, it appointed a director of social concerns, and it also, of course, voted in the early 80s for the ordination of women. Perhaps not as background as we might sometimes think. Then, of course, we must come to the charismatic movement, that second form of Pentecostal renewal. By the mid-20th century, events were transpiring which indicated that Pentecostalism was indeed going to penetrate out in to much of the rest of Christianity beyond itself. There were the healing crusades. Oral Roberts and Catherine Coleman, so excellently, pre excellently presented in that volume, All Things Are Possible, that study by an American historian. Here was TV healing evangelism. Here was the electronic church. But have subsequent studies have so shown all the fears that this was going to siphon money from regular congregations or keep people from attending church. No, no, that didn't happen at all. What it was, I think, was a form of pre-evangelism. These healing crusades coming across television suggested to all kinds of people that the supernatural working of God was still a live option in life. That had been largely lost in so many sections of Protestantism that this came as a startling revelation to all kinds of people and did cause them to think about the Christian faith. Also, they suggested that God was concerned with a whole person evangelism in Christianity, not just the soul, but the body and the material. These may at times be overdone and stretched, but I don't think it removes the great importance of what they were really trying to to get across. Then there was the emergence of the charismatic movement in what we may call the historic denominations. The leader, first of all, Dennis Bennett, an Englishman, formerly a Congregationalist clergyman, who had become a fairly high church Anglican again in California traveling widely, the publishing of Trinity Magazine by one of his associates, penetrating often, first of all, high church Anglicanism. We're going to talk tomorrow night about evangelical Anglicanism because subsequently the renewal became far stronger in evangelical Anglicanism than in high church Anglicanism. But initially, partly at least because of Bennett's influence, high church and then Roman Catholicism. Although we're basically talking about Protestant movements uh, some slight reference has to be made here. Both High Church Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism were more able to relate to the charismata, the miraculous, because they had never excluded and excised 
these aspects of the miraculous as mainline Protestantism had. As one studies the Reformation, what happened was that the Protestants, in defending themselves against Roman Catholicism and the claims of Roman Catholicism, had to say that the bishops did not have the authority that Roman Catholics claimed for them. They were not direct descendants of the apostles. They could not bestow the Holy Spirit. They could not grant miracle working power. And so our Protestant forebears, and I think a deluded burst uh, of defense, said all those things don't exist anymore. They all went out of existence with the early church. If ever there was a bit of historically conditioned exegesis in theology, I think it was that. And we Protestants, as a result, I feel, have been open game for the vagaries of all kinds of theological rationalism. It's hard to be too rationalistic when miracles are being done in one's presence. So, I think it was quite natural. We had put a ban on these things. High Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism had not. They might have been leery about lots of them, but they didn't have an official theological proscription of those kind of approaches. Now, because there was the strong anti-Pentecostal, anti-charismatic, anti-miraculous strain in most of our Protestantism, many of the people who received help through the charismatic movement of the 1950s and 60s found themselves either joining Pentecostal churches or founding new congregations often called Christian centers or something along that line. And then, of course, in 1967, the Catholic charismatic movement, starting at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, burst upon the scene. And then the Jesus movement the same year, beginning in California, and drawing counterculture young people in great numbers to faith in Christ and often in a kind of charismatic orientation. David Bebbington, the well-known Baptist, uh, church historian at the University of Stirling in Scotland, argues that the Pentecostal charismatic movement was uniquely designed for the 1960s when the postmodern world became popular and it had a style of faith and of life that made it very meaningful to people in such a culture. Now many other congregations adopted part of the charismatic agenda. Music, singing scripture songs, healing services, were increasingly announced and conducted. Emphasis on the fact that worship takes time. To have a service that only lasts one hour is almost an insult to God and an indication we have no idea of how God works in the human heart and life. Emphasis upon some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, perhaps in a somewhat laundered sense, but Nonetheless, there some of them were. I remember as a good representative of this kind of thing, and we might mention him tomorrow evening, visiting my friend Michael Green. Some of you may know Michael Green's books, Evangelism in the Early Church and others than that, as the rector of St. Aldate's Anglican Church in the city of Oxford, right across from Christ Church College, just across the street. If we think of Christ Church Oxford being the very epitome of Western culture, it was fascinating that I was having tea with Michael one afternoon in the late 70s, and I said, Michael, you've come down from being principal of the Theological College St. John's in Nottingham. What are you finding? 
are the main elements of ministry here at the heart of Oxford. He said, Ian, I give more of my time to exorcism, to the banishing of demons, than I do to any other part of my ministry. Fascinating. At the heart of our culture. Here's a man who says that that's what he's giving most of his time to. Here is the overspill. If one knows anything about evangelical Anglicanism, of which Michael is an excellent representative, one could not in the wildest flight of imagination 20 years before ever have expected that any well-bred evangelical Anglican would have ever said such a thing. And yet here it was. The Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, then the third wave. The third wave includes all kinds of Protestants and Catholics who stay in their church, who long and pray for more charismatic activity and manifestation, seek to be loyal, and uh, often pray hard that more will happen than is happening. Uh, the other part of the third word, uh, of the third wave, and something we have to say a little bit about, is the Vineyard Movement. Founded in Southern California by John Wimber, in the post-Jesus people world of the 1970s. He was pastor of what they call there the Evangelical Friends Church, the Church Quakers. He was longing for more of God's grace and power in his ministry. He saw things in the Pentecostal and charismatic movements that drew him, particularly healing and exorcism. And so the Vineyard Movement developed around Wimber. Wimber denies that he is either Pentecostal or charismatic, but I think he's really playing with words. He probably doesn't want to frighten people off, potential followers of the movement. But Now, he does deny that there needs to be a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he does deny that tongues are the sign gift. But he stands very squarely in the openness to the charisma, to, to the miraculous, particularly healing and exorcism taking place in the church today. And this movement has spread and has spread particularly to England where it hasn't started vineyard churches so much as where it has penetrated significant sections of the historic churches. Now we have the Toronto Airport Vineyard. Do you get this in your local papers? Uh, we get it constantly, of course, in the Globe and in the Star. Drawing people from around the world, as did the Azusa Street meetings almost nine decades ago. And uh, if you have ever met and listened to John Arnott, the pastor of the airport vineyard, who is a graduate of Toronto Bible College or Ontario Bible College some 25 years ago. He is one of the most laid-back people you would ever meet. In fact, Toronto Life magazine said he would like, make Perry Como look like a speed freak. Well, it, uh, it was a nice little turn of phrase. Yes, he, he just seems to be so relaxed, so easy. And there seems nothing hyper about the man at all. And as you probably have picked up, people ask for prayer and they subside into what is called carpet time and they are then prayed for. In response to such prayer, there are certain physical and vocal reactions often similar to what took place among our forebears if we came from the United States or even parts of Canada in the frontier camp meetings of 190, 195 years ago. Well, this movement is certainly gaining attention. The Toronto Tourist Board said it was the number one attraction of people to Toronto in 1944. When the Archbishop of Canterbury arrived in Toronto last summer, his first inquiry to the official who greeted him was, what's happening in the vineyard? The official in Toronto had never heard of the vineyard. 
telling one a little more about Toronto, I think, than about what was going on in England. Interesting that the two most prominent chroniclers of this movement and interpreters of it are both Acadia Divinity College students, or graduates, I should say. Whether that pleases you or disgusts you, well, I leave it to you. Uh, the one is Guy Chevreau, who is on the ministerial staff of the airport vineyard and who is naturally an ardent advocate, calling upon Jonathan Edwards and many other notables of church history to substantiate his views. Uh, the other is Jim Beverly, Professor of Theology and Ethics at Ontario Seminary and a very dear colleague and friend, who seeks to be a friendly but balanced critic. Strange as it may seem, in my last conversation with Beverly, he said that the fairness of his book is being praised even by many of the vineyard leaders in the United States, while the only major criticism has come from his erstwhile Acadio fellow student, Chevreau. Finally, a few words of conclusion. David Barrett, that insatiable Anglican ecclesiastical statistician who I now understand works for the Southern Baptist, is that correct? Uh, I don't know what that says, one might want to interpret that. Uh, he argues that Pentecostalism plus the charismatic movement plus the third wave with whatever's involved in it is the largest movement in Protestant Christendom today. Uh, he has its followers away up in the hundreds of millions. Clive Calver, the remarkable General Secretary of the Evangelical Alliance in England, who himself is a student of sociology of religion at Oxford, said to me very baldly, Ian, the only churches in England that are growing are those that are plugging into renewal on some level. He says, if all a church is doing is maintaining a tradition, I don't care where it is on the theological spectrum, it's dying. So, It seems we're the first something given to us by the Pentecostal charismatic third wave, wave movement. The penetration of other segments of Christianity by this movement is proceeding apace. It is certainly bringing some unique distinctives to the whole of the Christian church. the expected presence of supernatural and miraculous divine activity. Not just in the traditional Protestant acceptances of regeneration and sanctification, but in the physical and even in the material realm. It seems to me that there may be a whole gospel coming here which is of great importance. The supernatural gifts of the Spirit means that the church is much more of a community with its members gifted by the Holy Spirit for ministry than it is as an organization conducted by duly elected and recognized officers. A little while ago I had a call from one of the columnists in the Toronto Star and in the course of our conversation, she said, I was at Asian Court Pentecostal the other Sunday night, and they are doing what everybody else in society is looking for. She said, I had never realized it. She said, women were as active in that service as men. And a woman was preaching. She said, the congregation was 25 or 30 percent black and the blacks were not marginalized. They were at the heart of things as everybody else. She said, everybody in society is trying to get rid of sexism, racism. And then she said there was a tremendous socioeconomic variation in the congregation. She said, what all my secular friends are trying to do, these people are doing it. 
few weeks later, she came to another of my colleagues and said, tell me a good church to go to. I want to start finding out. Very interesting, the impact there is. The end result could be, I'm not prognosticating, could be a new form of Christianity appealing to an immensely wide spectrum of Christians, sharing a basic orthodox understanding of the Christian faith, a personal saving knowledge of God in Christ, and a life and ministry in the Christian community which is characterized by the presence of God in supernatural grace and judgment, which affects spirit and body. If that were to happen, I wonder if it wouldn't be like the prelude to the eternal city of God. Thank you.